I'm Sean Delaney, and today on the What Got You There podcast, I sit down with Carla Harris, who has more than three decades of experience on Wall Street, and she's currently the senior client advisor at Morgan Stanley. And we're going to talk about great leadership, what it takes to become an exceptional leader, what you can do with your team to help cultivate leaders, how to thrive in chaotic environments, and so much more. Now, Carla is someone who has extensive knowledge around this, and she's been put in the fire in terms of big risk and big pressure scenarios. Back in 2013, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to chair the National Women's Business Council, and she has also been named by Fortune Magazine's list of the 50 most powerful Black executives in corporate America. So get ready for a masterclass on great leadership with Carla Harris. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Carla, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm great, Sean. Thank you so much for having me today. Oh, absolutely. It is my pleasure. And one thing I saw just a few minutes ago that I would love to actually start with is you tweeted out a little Monday motivation this morning, and it's strong insight will lead you to focus on and execute what will be instead of what is. I would love for you to unpack this for us. Absolutely. And insight is really what leadership is all about. It is we have actually evolved from leadership being oversight to now insight, which was a key insight that I got out of a piece of research that the Executive Leadership Council did a few years ago. And as a leader, your job now is to think about what will be, not what is. It's not about execution and overseeing people doing exactly what they're doing. If you're gonna lead, you need to be thinking about the next thing and the next thing. What are the things that could impede success? What are the, the things that could happen that could come around the corner? You know, What are the things that could accelerate success, for example? It's your job to have that blank sheet of paper mentality every day as a leader to think about how do you move things ahead and what will be not what is. If you're focusing on what is, you're already behind. Absolutely. I know someone. you're someone who's extremely intentional. So I'm wondering how this focus of what will be actually looks like for you day to day. Oh, absolutely. I'm not only thinking about what, I, I, actually, I'll give you even the micro, micro version of that. One of my tricks, if you will, for high productivity is I make my to-do list the night before. So that when I come in in the morning, I say, what does success look like today, Carla? Because success on Monday is different than success on Wednesday or Thursday. And then I'm thinking about already, you know, how this whole week might evolve. You know, what are the things that are the, you know, accelerators, the things that have to get done, but the things that could get done that could really move the needle to make next week or the rest of this month very different. So I'm already thinking, you know, again, into the future. That's what it looks like for me on any given day not just what I'm doing today, getting through today, but I'm already focused on what does the end of the week look like with Friday? I love that. I'm actually really intrigued now just thinking about kind of how you operate your mindset. Do you feel there's been a mindset of yours that has just been incredibly impactful throughout your entire work life? Oh, I, I think it's the can-do attitude, no question about it. If you have arrived at a moment, Sean, if the universe has opened up and presented this opportunity, then you have to know you have everything you need to be successful. Now, the question is whether or not you're going to leverage the right tools in the tool chest. And each of us have at least three things in the tool chest, your intellect, your academic background, your experience, and your network. And the network is the one that is grossly underutilized. And for me, it, the, the fourth one is my, my spiritual, my, are my spiritual tools. So how you incorporate all of those and leverage them will dictate whether, when, and how you are going to be successful. Carla, have you always had this looking forward, positive type mindset? I've always had a positive mindset. I can't say that I've always been as forward looking as I am today as a leader, because when I was building my career, I was really focused on putting the points on the board right then. And there were so many things, Sean, that I did not know. So many other components that really inform your success, which is what I wrote about in my first book, Expect to Win understanding that perception is the co-pilot to reality, understanding that there's a key relationship in your career called a sponsor, not a mentor that you're going to have to have, understanding the importance of taking risks and that you must take risks if you're going to grow. You cannot have the safe strategy and maximize your success. So these were pearls that I was acquiring along the way. I had the positive 
you know, can do attitude. But so often when I encountered challenges, I was in that moment. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to get out of that? Oh my gosh, I got to go in the day and it's going to be as bad as it was yesterday. Oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I'm looking through the tunnel and, and, I'm, and I'm looking at the light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm thinking it could be the train that's about to run me over as opposed to daylight. So back then, encountering those early first challenges for me, you get stuck in the moment mm -hmm. and you don't realize that there is a through to this. And one of my good friends said to me that somebody told her, man, if you think you're going through hell, whatever you do, don't stop. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> I, uh, I, not to get off track, I, I have a family member uh, who, who's going through some cancer. And uh, she said, when you're going through hell, show up like you own the place. And I like, love that, right? Like, I like that too. Life's going to yes. be tough. Like, we, we've got to go through this. Uh, I'm really intrigued though. You, you hit on so many different things. I'm wondering about the early Carla, right? Like say you were starting out today, how fast can that, that knowledge, that wisdom, can that get sped up over time? Or is this just certain stuff you've got to live through to truly embody and ingrain? Yeah, no, I don't think you have to necessarily, Sean. That's why I wrote the playbook. That's why I wrote Expect to Win in the first place, because I realized that if I had had some of these pearls when I was starting out in my career, if you even remotely think that I have been successful, I would have been far more successful had I had these pearls. My learning curve would have been you know, much steeper than it actually was because I had no frame of reference. And so often when you're learning lessons for the first time, especially if you don't have anybody that you can bounce these things off, you get also stuck with, oh, this is only happening to me. Oh, nobody else has gone through this. And the one skill I think really smart people don't have is how to ask for help. So that's the other thing that delays you. You're sitting there for weeks sometimes, in my case, it's months, trying to suffer through it or figure it out on your own instead of having the skill to ask someone, Sean, am I crazy or is this happening? You know, Sean, you know, did you ever see anything that looked like this? Or Sean, I need to talk to somebody about this, but how do I say it? You can imagine for me, the first time I had a, a big issue and I went to talk to somebody and like, oh, you should talk to your boss. Well, Sean, despite the fact that I have two Harvard degrees, I was sitting there saying, okay, I understand I should talk to my boss, but what should I say? Yeah. Right? And it wasn't a matter of ignorance in that, you know, I didn't know how to put the grammar together. It was like, I didn't know what to say. How do you start the conversation? What do you do when they react this way versus that way? You need the guidance. And so if you've never seen this before, it takes you a long time before you even ask for help. And all of those things are delaying your success. You mentioned just certain points you can you can speed up that learning curve for yourself. What, was there a moment in time or what point of your career do you feel like you were on the steepest learning curve? I'd say that when I actually started uh, pricing transactions uh, in capital markets. So that was probably around six or seven years into my career. That was probably the steepest learning curve because I was working for somebody at that point who had pretty much you know, moved the obstacles out of the way and was sort of like, let me see what you can do. And so I was really only uh, impeded by my own appetite, my own curiosity, my own willingness to execute, my own risk appetite. And so I was really able to fly then and I learned a lot, especially once I realized that this person trusted me enough to execute and learn. And that's really important as a leader. And I talk about that in Lead to Win. You wanna create an environment where number one, your people know that it's okay to take risks because you need them to innovate. And if they are afraid to take risks, they won't truly innovate. They won't go as far as they can go. Number two, you need to create an environment where people know that you appreciate them, especially now. You know, boomers and older exes were pretty much used to not getting the praise and the adulation from the boss, but millennials and Zers, they need the feedback. They need the feedback. So I need to say, good job, Sean, or mm, not so great, but let me tell you what you can do next time and let's try it together. Because if they know you are investing in their career, they're far more apt to stay with you and, and you will do a much better job on retention. Number three, you need to be a great listener, right? Because if your people know that they can finish a sentence with you and that, that you're truly listening and embracing, then they're again, gonna be far more apt to give you more than 100%. So these are things that are very important today as leaders that I would argue were not you know, as important or you could get away with not doing those things 20 years ago, 30 years ago.
Can you expand even further on risk? Uh, basically, two things I'd love to cover with you around risk. Both, how do you think about personally taking on different risks? Yes. And then how do we cultivate that environment so people can feel the ability to take risks? So I'd, yes. I'd love to start the first part, how you handle risk. Okay, so let me, let me talk about that. When you are faced with something that feels like a risk, here's how you decide whether or not you should do it. Ask yourself three, three questions. Number one, will this new thing give me skills and experiences that I wouldn't get if I stayed right here for another 12 months? Second thing, will this new thing expose me to people, relationships, and networks that I wouldn't get if I stayed right here another 12 months? And third question, will this new thing now generate new branches on my personal decision tree of opportunity, i.e. I could go off and do some other things that I would not have been able to do if I stayed right here another 12 months. If the answer to all three of those questions is yes, you should absolutely take the risk. The second thing is remember, when you take a risk, you're going to get one or two things. You're going to get the blessings or the lessons. Right. And the blessing is, OK, you accomplished that thing you took the risk for. And the lessons are the things that now teach you how to do it differently or better the next time. Both are valuable. And the third thing I'm going to tell you about risk is that there are very few things in life that are irreparable. Mm. Most things can be fixed. So no worry about that at all. But that's how how you think about it. Now, how do you create an environment where your people want to take risks? You celebrate the failures. In teaching people how to innovate, you must teach them how to fail. And in teaching them how to fail, you celebrate the failures. So when Shaw takes a huge risk that might be a colossal, it may cost you profitability that quarter, you go, oh, Sean, that was a big one. That was a big one. That would make cost us because you must be authentic. But now you say, but let's all give Sean a hand because he took the risk. And because we, he took that risk, we now know the following three things that can impact our next try and our probable success. As a leader, you must be productive and constructive in your responses when your people take risks. Because if you have a markedly adverse reaction, then please know the person on the other side of that reaction and the people who are witnessing directly or indirectly what happened, they will never go there again. And that will now impede your ability to innovate which will ultimately impede your competitiveness in the marketplace. Is that one of the major challenges, especially when working with young people where we're so indoctrined, right? Like to, to not take risks, not fail. I'm just wondering, you mentioned a few minutes ago, the importance of being able to handle and understand the lesson, right? Like there's some wisdom in those failures. And I'm, Absolutely. I'm, yeah. yeah, and that's what you have to do. Your job as a leader is to talk about that. Say, oh yes, I failed millions of times in my life. And you know what, don't take it so hard you know, Denise, because you failed on that one. But now what do you know? And you wouldn't have known that if you hadn't tried. So no big deal. Let's move on to the next thing. You have to create that environment. You have to give that attribution and that confirmation that it's okay. And then, as I said, the easiest way to do that is to celebrate it. Yeah, that might have been a huge mistake, but because, you know, Denise took it, we gained something from that. And everybody will be watching and they will test you to see if you believe that, or if you mean that as a leader, be ready for the test, pass, and keep driving. Can, can you go further about always being tested as a leader, right? Like, I think a lot of times leaders sometimes forget they are always in the spotlight, their body language, their responses. I'm just wondering how you think about that. Yes, and I'm going to say this to you, but you, you completely get it as a parent of a two-year-old and a four-year-old. They watch everything. They soak up everything which is why people tell you to be careful about what you say, be careful about your response, because then you see it played out in your two-year-old or your four-year-old. Well, I don't, I'm not trying to suggest that the people on your team are two-year-olds and four-year-olds, but we're people. And people take clues and hints, and they even create narratives that may or may not be there around their leaders. So you have to be intentional, which is the big bulk of the chapter, as you know, of Lead to Win. I talk about intentional leadership. You have to be intentional about how you show up every day if you want to be that powerful, impactful leader in today's environment. You cannot um, take for granted that your people aren't taking their cues from you. And guess what? Even when you're having a bad day, even when you're not feeling 100%, being authentic about that, saying, hey, listen, I'm going to need you guys to prop me up today. Right. Because I don't have all my leadership mojo today. I'm going to give you the best I got. But, you know, I know I'm know I'm lagging a little bit behind, but 
you help me, I'm, I'm going to help you tomorrow, right? And your people appreciate that. Everybody doesn't have 150% day every day. Own that too. Yeah, I, I feel like there's probably a lot of leaders hearing that kind of like, whoa, wait a second. Like I can actually open up and express that. You know what? Today's not my day. Can, can you expand on that? Yes. I mean, I think the authenticity is powerful. And in today's environment, Sean, authenticity is going to be critical to leading and, and, and really managing effectively because we're in an environment where all the covers have been torn off because of the COVID-19 crisis, because of the social unrest that, we, that we, we all have gone through since 2020 in particular, right? So now if your people don't feel like you're being authentic, then it breaks down to can they trust you? And if they cannot trust you, they're not going to follow you into territories unknown. And we're all walking into territories unknown because none of us have ever lived on the other side of a global pandemic. So by definition, it's territories unknown. And you have to understand as a leader, you need your people's trust to go into unknown territories. So being authentic, like it's not my day, but I'm gonna give you the best that I got today, mm -hmm. right? But I'm not feeling a hundred, right? To me, that also invites people to, to interact with you differently. It, it may invite people to tread lightly, it may help you in your less than day, but being honest about that gives them the freedom to say they're not honest about it. And if they're going to support you on your less than day, then there's an implicit assumption that you're going to support them. Carla, when did you really feel the congruency between your authentic self and how you're showing up, right? Like I think early on in careers, we're, we're trying to navigate the complexity, right? Like who am I as a leader? Or like, how am I showing up? And I w wonder when you really felt that, that authentic alignment with yourself. Yeah, I'll probably say I was five-ish years into my career because what happens, Sean, is that even somebody like me who's always been just Carla, I've always been authentic, when you walk into an environment and you're not immediately as successful as you want it to be or as you have been in the past, the first thing you start doing is thinking that you're doing something wrong and maybe you should adopt the way this person speaks, maybe you should present the way that person, maybe you should show up like somebody else. And if you're not careful, you start losing the essence of who you really are. And that's when you create the competitive disadvantage. So I too fell prey to that in the very early days because it was tough in those early days. It, I was not being as successful as I thought I should be, but I, and I didn't know why. I didn't know what was going on or what I could do differently. And it was probably four or five years into my career after I had you know, fallen a few times, gotten up, fallen a few times, gotten up, that I realized that I had lost a lot of who Carla Harris was because of a comment that somebody made. I had a manager director say to me, you know, you're smart, you work hard, but I don't think you're tough enough for this business. And it blew me away. I'm like, what, <laughs> what is this guy smoking, right? You can call Carla a lot of things, but ain't tough, ain't one of them. But then I realized that perhaps I was behaving and speaking in a way that was making him think, let alone the rest of the organization think that I wasn't tough enough. And the wake up call, Sean, was that is not how I saw myself. Mm. So what was I doing that the real Carla wasn't showing up? And it turned out as I examined it, that I had lost my confidence. I had swallowed my voice and I was moving further and further back. So in order to flip myself back into my reality, I decided I would walk tough talk tough, eat tough, drink tough, use tough in my language. Because if you want people to think about you in a certain way, and I write about this in chapter four of Expect to Win, then your behavior has to be consistent with the three adjectives that you want them to think or to use when, when they're talking about you and you're not in the room. And so that was mine that got me. And sure enough, in about 90 days after walking, talking, drinking, eating tough, uh, I had a team of people coming to see me. They didn't know I was behind them. And the VP was beating up the poor associate. Do you have the backup analysis? You have the synergy analysis? We're going to see Carla Harris. You know she's so tough. So they will start to think of you in that way if you have consistent behavior around those adjectives. But you bring up a good point, Sean. Know who you are. That is the first step to bringing all of your authenticity into any environment. Number one, know who you are. Number two, embrace the fact that we're all multifaceted. There's a pensive you, there is an intellectual you, there's a frivolous you, a funny you, a thoughtful you, a quiet you. Embrace all those facets. And now the third key to bringing all of you into an environment, now you relax. Now you can relax and meet people where they are. You can walk into any scenario, one-on-one, -on -one, 15 people in the boardroom, thousand people in the audience, 
and you can feel the energy in the room and decide in that moment which part of you, which facet will authentically connect with the people on the other side of that exchange. Speaking of different facets, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed by you. Uh, I know you're an accomplished gospel singer with, with four albums, and you've performed at Sold Out Crabs at Carnegie Hall and Apollo Theater. What are the commonalities between showing up and being able to perform at a venue like that and some of the great leadership you do day to day? It's, it's actually the, the very same thing. When, when I walk onto that stage at Carnegie Hall or the Apollo, I'm bringing all of Carla. I'm bringing Carla the banker. Carla, the producer who's put together the concert. I'm bringing together Carla, the leader, because I have an amazing band and backup singers, in some cases a choir, and plus a whole production crew. You know, I'm bringing Carla, the woman that just loves to sing gospel and who at that moment has prayed up the spirit before I walk on that stage. And, and I'm like bursting to give that spirit to the people in the audience. I'm Carla, the listener, who wants to feel the energy of somebody who might have come to the concert looking for something. Uh, an answer, a feeling, some inspiration. And, you know, and I pray that I might be able to to do that and touch them in some way in one song. So all of those crawlers are coming to the stage and I allow myself to feel the energy. And I'm going to give you an example. My very first Carnegie Hall concert, we had practiced so hard. We had worked so hard. And there were 14 songs that I was going to sing. But Sean, I got to number 11 and I knew I was already on the mountaintop. Everything in me said, if you sing one more note, you're going to be on the other side of that mountain. <laughs> Don't do it. So I looked, I made sure I was feeling what I was feeling. And I said, good night, everybody. And my band was like, what, 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 what? We got three more songs to sing. What do we? <laughs> but I knew I could feel the energy in the audience. They were happy. They were there. There was nothing I could do but drag them back down the hill. <laughs> I was not going to do that. That that comment, there is such a deep, intuitive understanding of both yourself, environment, everything like that. Is that just something that just takes years or decades to get to? I'm just wondering how you think that through, because there is so much power in that story. Yeah, I think there's there's an intentionality to to just be mm -hmm. right and to be confident and assure of yourself that you can allow changes to happen in the moment and be OK with that pivot. And as a leader, that is so important. You can't be so wedded to the strategic plan when you got evidence right there. I had the evidence right there. The crowd was on their feet. They were loving it. They had sat through 11 songs. They had had a good time. And, and, and I just, I didn't say, oh, but we rehearsed 14 songs. I'm going to sing these last three songs. We worked so hard and I'm paying the band. And if the goal was to have people walking out there feeling good about the fact that they came to support that evening or they came looking for something and they got it, then girl, done. Victory. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. If you could perform with with any musical act of all time, who would you love to be share a stage with? Of all time? Yeah. Mm. I, I would have to say it's Aretha Franklin because she unfortunately is gone and she's the only one that I really don't have the opportunity to perform with right now. But, um, oh man, if of the ones that are living off, oh, I could do something with Gladys Knight, Patti LaBelle, CeCe Wine, and oh, Yolanda Adams. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, That'd be well, awesome. Well, automatically, uh, I, I think this translates to leadership too, because your willingness and ability to study other great leaders, great musicians. I'm just wondering, like, when, when did you first really become interested in leadership? You know, I, I think I've always been a student, Sean, I have to tell you, after uh, doing what I have done on Wall Street for 35 years and leading transactions, I've had an opportunity to study some great leaders and frankly, not so much up close and personal at one of the most important moments, you know, in their lives as a CEO or a CFO, because they're ma doing a major capital raise or they're going public for the first time. I have sat at the seat of some amazing and not so much leaders in my own career within my own organization. And I've always been a studier of persons and having an aspiration to be a leader is what led me to study leaders. I'm just thinking about the vision, right? Like that's why you study because of that. How do you think about vision day to day with, with oh. the people you work with? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think you have to have something that you're working towards every day, right? So I am, I am a big fan of developing your people. So anytime when I got to the point where I had people working with me, I always was thoughtful about 
am as this person learning am i providing an opportunity for them to learn through the assignments that they're they've been given or that i am giving them or uh the opportunities for them to present or uh, am I giving them the opportunity to lead and to grow because of who I'm making sure they get in front of? So I've always been thoughtful about that because I do think that that's a leader's job. Re really understanding what, what's what's enough, what's not too much, right? Like continually pushing them that expansion. You talked about that earlier in your career. Um, that's right. That, that that's you took right. that responsibility, you took those roles. One of the things you were mentioning during that story is just some of the blind spots that you had. And I'm wondering how you've gone about over the years now identifying the blind spots in yourself. Yeah, recognizing them and owning them. And I'll tell you one that was a huge blind spot for me and that I write about in the book. And that was the blind spot of giving people too many chances. And, um, you know, it's funny, Sean, I had to ask myself, and I did this, frankly, over the pandemic, if you're so decisive about everything else as a leader, why do you drag your feet? when it comes to making people changes, especially if people are not as effective as you would like them to be as leaders. And I had to unpack that, like, what is that? And I realized that it was cultural because as a black woman growing up in the South, you know, my folks told me, you don't have as many chances as everybody else. You know, world's not fair. You, you get one chance. So don't screw it up, don't blow it. So I realized that having that tape play over and over in your head, it, it had to impact your risk appetite. Because if you think you only got one shot, you're definitely not going to blow it. And you're going to be real careful with that one shot. And a part, of course, I never felt like that was fair, that I would only get one shot and everybody else would get more. So I think what happened is that in my own mind, I said, ah, but when I get to the point where I can give people shots, I'm going to be a lot more liberal about that. But the problem is, especially if it's somebody that you have a lot of belief in uh, and you trust this person, if they're not getting there, you keep you start making excuses in your own mind. Well, they they probably this or that may not be doing what right. That may not be going the right way. Or maybe I didn't develop them in the right way. Maybe I should do blah, blah, blah. So you keep coming up with that. Meanwhile, whenever you fail to move someone who is inadequate as a leader, you hold the rest of the organization hostage. Another really great leader who I admire a lot said that to me in a fireside chat and it boy it was like a cayenne pepper moment it was like that's right that is the reason you have to do it if you're choosing to sit in the leadership seat because otherwise you hold the rest of the organization hostage yeah you mentioned some deeply personal views you had to change there those are, those are some of the hardest to shift those, those mental models those mindsets that we've had for years and years and years how else do you go about stress testing your thinking because, oh, sure. Through yeah. your experiences, through your experiences, you know, Sean, and being open to listen to other people's perspectives mm -hmm. and, and realizing that you learn as much from other people and experiences as you learn from a book. And if you shut off someone's ability to engage with you fully, then you're cheating yourself out of a learning opportunity. I had, you know, a, a, an executive asked me just last week as I was speaking for, you know, a major corporation, he said, you know, listen, we all are a function of where we, you know, how we were brought up, where we grew up, and we have perspectives about people, you know, how would you suggest I get past that? And I told him, I said, you know, the same goes on the other side, you know, as a person of color, you know, and this happened to be a white male executive who was asking me this question, I said, as a person of color, you know, it used to be that if I had someone that looked like you approach me, I already had the defenses up because mm -hmm. I'd already been not treated well by somebody who looks like you. So now I was transferring that experience onto you. I was professional. I was nice, but mm, didn't trust you because I'm just waiting for you to do that other thing. Right. And I realized that by doing that, I was cheating myself because a you're a different person. B, you might have a lot to offer me intellectually and experientially and C you know, how dare I misjudge you or your intentions based on somebody else's actions? That's just not fair. And I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me. So it was intentional for me to keep practicing to change my mindset so that I would give everybody, no matter who you are, a fair chance with me until otherwise notified. I just have so much respect for the level of self-awareness that you've cultivated over the years. And I feel like self-awareness is one of those things. It's tough to pass on. And so I'm just wondering, what are you looking for 
for the people that you lead to help them develop that self-awareness, right? Like the, the old saying, when the student is, te- is ready, the teacher appears. I'm just wondering how you think about self-awareness, building that up in the people you lead. Yeah, sometimes you can do it uh, informally and sometimes you have to do it formally and you have to do it directly. So I, I assess the person that I'm trying to help with that as to how they need to get it. And if they really don't get it and, and won't, won't be able to get it informally, then I don't believe in wasting time giving hints. I believe in going straight, no chaser. And I'll say, here's what I see of you. And oh, by the way, here's the feedback that I'm getting about you. And if you want to be more effective, if that is your aspiration, then my suggestions would be that you think about blah, blah, blah. And after I've given that feedback, Sean, then I look for ways to affirm it and reinforce it. So when the person does it, I say, yes, see, you did blah, 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 and you did it well, now do that again, right? I try to give them the attaboys and the girls around that to encourage them that they're now on the right road and that they can execute, right? And if they backslide or they do something in the old way, I'll say, okay, now you're falling into that. Now let's stop and think about, were you too busy? Is that why you defaulted? Were you tired? That's why you defaulted. You know, have you not fully owned the new thing? You don't believe it. Let's talk about that. So I try to do it that way if I have to do the straight in your face, no chaser kind of thing. But if the person is good at picking up cues in general, then I try to reinforce that skill mm-hmm. uh, and we'll give it to them around the periphery. Hmm. It's, it's art, not science. Well, one of the things I feel like I'm sensing here is is almost oscillation, right? Like full on, then off. You've got to you've got to unpack, you've got to unwind, you've got to recover, you've got to analyze what's working. How do you think about that day to day? Right, like 35 years on Wall Street. I mean, you, I'm sure every minute of your day could be packed up. Like, how, how do you allocate the time, or what does that look like day to day, so that you do have time to really uh, reflect, to think, to get intentional about what's coming? Yes. Okay. So Sean, here's a very important pearl from the book, Lead to Win. Leadership is a journey from execution to empowerment. Very important for you to learn because if you're like me and you are a natural executor, you will execute to your heart's delight. And so letting go of the execution feels uncomfortable if you are an executor, but you cannot be in the position of empowering and inspiring other people if you're mired down in the execution, because there's always something to do. So for me, unlocking that time, and I have a really good friend of mine who used to say, Carla, you need some white space on your calendar. You Mm -hmm. need some white space on your calendar. And I realized, again, self-reflection, one of the reasons that I would fill up my calendar with so so many things to do is that it felt good. As an executor, that's your food, that's your fuel, right? And it felt uncomfortable to have the white space where I could just create. But I started to realize without that white space on the calendar, where do you think? Where do you create? Where do you construct a vision? How do you think about truly the development of your people and where you need to take someone if you're always doing something? You have to leave the time and you have to redefine the do as think. If you're thinking, you're doing something. So don't discount that because you're not functioning with, uh, you're not being physical around something. So once I shifted the, the lens that I still get to do, but the do is now create, uh, that felt obviously comfortable and I became more intentional about, about doing that. Thinking about the white space that, that you've cultivated so that you can be able to think about big things. One of the things uh, I get uh, listeners ask about is how do we build a trust in an environment where trust has been broken down in the past? Say they, they're a leader, they come into a new spot. How have you seen that play out? How should a leader think about that? Yeah, most important thing to do is call a thing a thing. That mm-hmm. is the eighth pearl of intentional leadership is, that I write about in chapter six is voice. Call a thing a thing. So if the trust has been impaired, and even if it wasn't by you, um, if it wasn't by you, it's even easier. Say, let's call a thing a thing. I know you feel like the organization has done something and you guys don't trust it. Or the person that was in the seat before me, there's some things that you don't trust it. But I'm, I'm going to ask you to walk with me and say new day new day and let me tell you how i'm thinking about the vision and how we're going to conduct ourselves and how we're going to work together because it's not about you or me it's about us and set that up together and invite them in to to co-create with you and and keep that behavior consistent because the way you build trust as i write about in in lead to win is that you deliver over and over and over again on the value proposition and everybody has a value proposition meaning People will always tell you what they want. They will always tell you what they value, but you need to ask the question so they can define that which they value. And then you can strategize on how you deliver 
on that value proposition. So as a leader, you have to engage with your people and you understand the motivators. Some people are motivated by money and power. Some people are motivated by title and stature and platform. Some people are motivated by the public at a girl, at a boy, if I can just give you some gross generalizations there, right? And once you engage, you, you realize what's the stimulus for each of your people and you engage on that basis and you build trust around that. So if I know that you care about me doing exactly what I said, then I'm going to say to you, okay, so what do you need me to do on that, Sean? You tell me the three things I need to do. Well, I'm going to make it my business within an hour to come back to you and say, I got A done. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of the day, I'm going to say, I got B done. So naturally you're thinking, well, dog, <laughs> she does what she says she's going to do. It might take me two weeks to deliver on C, but the fact that I got A and B done, you're already thinking that perhaps I'm somebody you can trust. Mm -hmm. And then for me to continue to do that over and over, that's what creates trust with any of us. Thinking about your own motivation, uh, I'm intrigued. What is it for you with, with sitting down, taking the time to write Lead to Win? Like, what is that deep motivation inside of you? Because clearly there, there's so much that just like exudes out of you. So I just want to know, like, at your core, what is that for the book Lead to Win? Yeah, feeling that I can help people be successful in what they have chosen to do. And if you are in a leadership seat, you have chosen to take that seat. And I realized that we were in a different environment than the one that I grew up in as I was building my career. And I realized that there were a lot of people who are at my stage in life who are in those seats now who are ill prepared to actually lead the constituency that they have to lead now, the millennials and the Zers. And how do I know that? I got so many calls, Sean, over the course of the pandemic, especially in 2020, with leaders saying, how do I lead in this moment? You know, we're not in the same place. How do I motivate and inspire my people to to continue to deliver we still have a quarter to deliver when we're not in the same place meaning i can't manage them i can't overlook what they're doing right because the leadership was about oversight not insight you know how do i make sure we don't backslide on diversity we have done so many things and we were moving down the journey and now you know we're not in the same place what do i do about that how do i speak about the murder of George Floyd. We have never talked about these kinds of things. I've never had a race conversation. And I was sort of sitting there like, oh my goodness, as I got these calls, Sean, and I realized, I said, okay, there's a measure of fear that's out there right now with current leadership as because they're not sure how to lead and to rebuild cultures on the other side of this pandemic. Perhaps I have some insight around that. How can I help leaders think more commercially about diversity and not the way we've thought about it for 30 years, like it was the right thing to do? Because as humans, we may not agree on the right thing to do, but as business animals, we will agree on the commercial thing to do, right? How do I help people have more courage around calling a thing a thing? Because there were so many things that I saw that should have been said in boardrooms that were not said, right? So how do I help people unlock that with courage today now that we all have a blank sheet of paper opportunity, right? Everything has been upset. The rule books are being rewritten. There is no playbook of how to manage, lead, engage, you know, drive revenue on the other side of a pandemic. So maybe I got a shot of getting through because we're all here. So that's why I wrote it. Do you enjoy operating in the chaotic and complex world? Yes. That's where you thrive? Yes, because chaos breeds opportunity, Sean, mm. every time. Every time, when, because most people get distracted by the chaos. And if you have clear vision and clear thought, you can advance. Yeah, can you even go further, right? Like that focus, that narrowing down and not getting, getting I don't know, just, just completely dysfunctional around the things that aren't truly mattering in this moment or that you can't control. I'd love for you to expand on this. You just hit it. They don't really matter and you cannot control them. So why are you focusing on it? Right. And, and I'll give you an example, a practical example. When the pandemic, when the shutdown first happened, I'll never forget March 13th, 2020. It was my last trip for a long time. And, but I thought at the time this was going to be a two week thing. So companies were shutting down and there was something in the air, news articles or something that suggested this might be for a couple of weeks. So I said, Ooh, what I know these two weeks are going to be over. What will I want to have done with this time? I can't control that I can't go in the office. I can't control that we're in the shutdown mode. You know, some people didn't know what Zoom was. Some people didn't have Zoom, whatever. And because we weren't even engaging like that, right? And I said, wow, what do I want to accomplish? Well, I want to get back on my, my workout regimen because, you know, I've already fallen off of my resolution since January and it's March. I can start working out again. Whew, 
Let me clean my office that I've been trying to clean for two years. Let me get that all organized. Little, little did I know it would be on, <laughs> on screen for two and a half years. But I said, here are the things I can control. Here are the things I want to accomplish in these two weeks. Well, when it was clear that two weeks was not going to be a month or two months, I said, Poof, what can I get done? Because these 60 or 90 days are going to go. I want to be able to say I accomplished this. So I sort of had a rolling goal set of things that I could get done that I could feel good about. I defined that. That's your power. What's going to bring you joy? What's going to make you feel accomplished? What's going to make you feel good? And I set these goals. And it kept going. And then after all these conversations, I said, Woo, I don't know how much time we're still going to be in this shelter in place mode, but I think I can write a book. Let me write down some of these thoughts. <laughs> and, you know, and then on top of that, I adopted another baby. And I was like, oh, well, let me. <laughs> so, you know, it was it was uh, one goal after, uh, after the other. Yeah. Wait, two questions that keep just kind of circling in the back of my mind is like, what's possible? And then who will I become? I feel like those are two things that you seem to just embody. And I, I just love it so much. But with, with all this, there, there's pressure there. It makes me think of the, the great Billie Jean King uh, quote, pressure is a privilege. And I'm just wondering how you think about and how you handle the enormous amounts of pressure that you are under. First of all, I love Billie Jean King. Second of all, that quote is in my book. That's exactly right. And I attribute it to her. And if you're choosing to wear the leader jersey and sit in the leadership seat, then you do have to understand that that's a privilege. It is a privilege to be able to impact other people's lives, to invest in them, to try to help them be successful. It's a privilege and you cannot take that as a right. So you have to treat it with care and really be committed to trying to be your best every day. You're going to make mistakes. You're gonna have foot faults to use a tennis al uh, analogy, but um, at the end of the day, if your intention was to be your very best, um, then that's all you can ask for. And you need to be able to pivot. You need to be able to grow. You need to have even more of a commitment to learning, I would argue, Sean, than, than anybody else and listening, right? Because sometimes your people are trying to tell you things and for your own blind spots or, or, or you're just deaf to a different perspective. And you have to push against that every day. What has that continual learning looked like for you over the years? Because it's it's obvious you are just a voracious learner, not just of books, but around like the room, around what's happening. It's it's just a, something I admire about you. I'm just wondering what that's looked like as that's evolved over time. Thank you. It's been so fulfilling because again, I do honestly believe that I can learn from all kinds of sources and from all people. So I go I go into any situation expecting to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm learning right now from you. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to learn over the course of this week as the book is released and people give me their feedback to it. I'm going to learn from the questions. And you'll see in my acknowledgments, I always thank my mentees and the people who read my work and the people who look at my videos. I always thank them because as much as I think I'm answering questions in the book, they always have some new ones for me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those new questions will dictate what I write about the next time because I'll say, oh, I didn't cover that. And oh, I maybe have more than a chapter to write about that. Oh, that opens up this whole new thought. So people's inquiries and the things that they need help on inspire me. I'll, I'll certainly have the, some of the videos linked up because I want to direct the listeners to some of those videos as well, because you are just so spot on your direct, your presence, your ability to to transmit some of these ideas, I think is exceptional. So I'll link those up. But the latest book Thank is you. Win. Carla, anything else you want to share with the listeners about the book? Obviously, we'll have where they can buy it linked up. But anything else you want to share? Yes, I want to say it's not just for people who are sitting in a corporate environment right now or in a large nonprofit environment. If you are um, an early stage entrepreneur, and I don't mean early by age, I mean you're just starting up your company, you know, there are chapters in there for you too, because I recognize that while you may be genius in creating this product, that doesn't mean you know how to attract or interview the right team. And if you're an early stage entrepreneur and you make a bad hire, it can be catastrophic because first of all, it was a six figure hire. Second of all, that might represent months of burn rate for you. And third, you now, you now have impacted your culture and the other people on your team are looking at you like, why did you do that to us? So it's even more critical that you're careful about who you're hiring. So I have a whole chapter in there, Sean, of if you don't have any interview skill, interviewing skills, if you don't have a kitchen cabinet that you can call on to, to interview some of your candidates and it's just you, 
here are the 15 questions that you can ask, and here's what you're looking for in an answer that will help you decide whether or not this is the right next, second, or third, or fifth person to bring on to your emerging team. Yeah. Carla, one of the things you do is great leadership cannot just be applied to one domain, right? Like us with our two-year-olds, like it can be applied there. You mentioned adaptability, team building, self-awareness. These are available and important in any domain you're doing, whether you're a startup or you're in our Fortune 100 company. So I appreciate you highlighting that. One final thing I love asking, if you could do this long-form conversation, sit down with anyone dead or alive, who would you love to interview? Oh, wow. I'd, I'd have to say it's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Fantastic. He was the first leader I keyed in on, and I would want to talk to him. Well, Carla Harris, the latest book is Lead to Win. I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Thank you so much for having me, Sean.